Amy Mihaljevic was abducted and murdered in October of 1989. She was only 10 years old when she went missing. This is her story. Amy Renee Mihaljevic was born 12-11-1978. She lived in Bay Village, which is a suburb just west of Cleveland, Ohio. She lived with both of her parents, Margaret and Mark, and her older brother, Jason. Bay Village was considered a safe place to raise a family. It had good schools, nice neighborhoods, and low crime rates. Friday, October 27, 1989 was like any other day for the Mihaljevic family. The parents both went to work and Amy and her brother rode their bikes to school. The regular routine was both Amy and Jason were to call and check in with their mom at work once they got home. Amy got out of school an hour before her brother did, so she was usually the first one home and she should have been the first one to call her mom. However, when Jason arrived home that afternoon, Amy was not there. He called his mother about 3.15 p.m. to let her know that Amy didn't come home after school. This didn't immediately set off any alarm bells as she remembered Amy saying something about staying late after school to try out for choir. She told Jason not to worry and that Amy should be home soon. About a half hour later, Jason called his mother back to report that Amy was still not home. Call it a mother's intuition, she started to feel that something wasn't right. Just as Margaret was gathering her things, preparing to leave work early, the phone rang. To her surprise and relief, it was Amy. She asked Amy how the tryouts for choir went, in which Amy said that they went okay. She asked Amy how she was doing, and Amy stated that she was fine. Their conversation was brief, nothing out of the ordinary, ending with the usual, I love you and I'll see you later. One report I read stated that Margaret asked Amy if she was calling from home, in which Amy told her that she was, but another report I read stated that she assumed that Amy was calling from home. Margaret tried to resume her work, but there was this nagging feeling that there was still something amiss. She replayed in her head the conversation she had just had with her daughter. Knowing how much of a little chatterbox Amy was, it seemed really odd to her that Amy only answered her questions with brief statements or single word answers. Margaret decided to leave from work early after all and arrived home about 4.30 p.m. As she entered the house, Jason stated that Amy still wasn't home and with those words, Margaret knew her daughter was in trouble. She immediately turned around, got in her car, and drove to Bay Middle School hoping to find Amy, but the school was already closed and the parking lot was empty. She could see the bike rack contained one lone bike and as she got closer, she could see that it was Amy's. She rushed over to the Bay Village Police Department. Something in the way that Margaret expressed her concerns to the officers made them feel that this was more than just a kid who might be hanging out with their friends when they should be home. The police released the first bolo, which is a be on the lookout for Amy around 5.15 p.m. It gave a full description of Amy for all of the city's patrolling officers to keep a lookout for her. Neighboring cities also received this information. At 6.30 p.m., Mark, the father, returned home from work to find the police in his house and Margaret in a panic. They searched the entire house, their yard, as well as neighboring yards. They questioned neighbors and searched trash cans. Amy wasn't with any of her friends and no one knew where she was. By 7 p.m., a large search team had been organized. Family, friends, neighbors, volunteers, and police searched a local ravine that ran straight through to Lake Erie. Throughout the night, many people could hear the searchers calling out Amy's name. The search went on for many hours, but they found no signs of the missing 10-year-old. It had become apparent to everyone involved that Amy must have been abducted. Police knew statistically that recovering an abducted child and one that's still alive, the odds of that happening drastically drop after the first six hours. This was becoming bigger than the police department could handle alone, so the FBI got involved. Friday night soon turned into Saturday morning, and the FBI agents scattered around the neighborhood to question everybody. It would be one of these neighbors who would provide the first big break into the investigation. This neighbor's daughter was a friend of Amy's, and a grim picture began to emerge about what happened to her. The daughter relayed some truly disturbing information to the agents. In the days leading up to Amy's disappearance, a mysterious man had been calling the Mihaljevic house in which he spoke to Amy a few times. This girl's story was confirmed by a few other of Amy's friends who had been let in on what Amy called a secret. Her brother Jason even overheard part of one of these phone calls. This man was able to earn the trust of young Amy by claiming he was either a family friend or a co-worker of her mother. The man asked Amy to meet him at the Bay Village Shopping Center, which was only a block away from her school. Here, he would give her $45 to help him purchase a special gift for her mom to congratulate her on a promotion that she'd received at work. Margaret had received no such promotion, but she had recently started a new job. For Amy's help, he would give her an additional 
additional $25 to do with as she pleased. The man told her that this meeting would have to be kept secret so she wouldn't ruin the surprise. Amy did as the man requested and did not disclose this information to anyone except for a few of her friends. That Friday, Amy got out of school at 2.04 p.m. She and two of her schoolmates walked the short distance to the Bay Village Shopping Center. This shopping center was a local hangout for many of the middle schoolers once school let out. With it being a warm and sunny afternoon, many were in high spirits. Most of us can recall what it felt like as a kid to get out of school on a Friday afternoon, knowing that you had the next two days of freedom, and with the weather being nice to boot, I know as a kid that would have made me happy. Once Amy and her friends arrived at the plaza, Amy waited outside of the Baskin Robbins ice cream store while the other two friends went on to do other things. It would be outside of this Baskin Robbins store that her friends would last see her around 3 p.m. There were several witnesses as well as shop owners who also saw Amy standing there. They said that she looked to be waiting for someone. A few people saw a man approach Amy. There was a brief conversation between him and her. He then placed his hand on the middle of her back, guiding her towards the parking lot and presumably to his car. These people weren't paying 100% attention to the interaction, so no one really saw what car they got into. There was no real reason for people to be concerned. There was no yelling or crying, there was no struggle, nothing really to draw their attention further. Most of them thought that it was just a normal interaction between a father and a daughter. This man was not her father though. He was a complete unknown to the Mahalovic family. He wasn't compulsive, he was calculating and patient. He was very bold to meet her in broad daylight at a busy shopping center. He had thought this through. He he knew where Amy lived and he knew her phone number. He knew where her mother worked and what time she usually arrived home. Did this man really know Amy's mother? Was he known to the family in some way? Was he involved in her school somehow? Was he a neighbor? All of these questions and more have never been answered. It's heartbreaking that he was able to lure Amy under the guise that she would be doing something nice for her mother. The two schoolmates of Amy's that had walked to the shopping center with her were able to give the FBI a rough description of this man. He was a white male, 35 to 40 years in age, slightly muscular build, dark wavy hair, possibly graying in certain spots. One of them recalled seeing a bald spot. He was between 5'8 and 5'10 in height. He had round glasses according to one of them, but the other one didn't seem to remember seeing glasses. And they remember that this man was wearing a tan jacket. So you see that the details are kind of vague. They're kind of all over the place, really. It's hard to remember particular details of a person when you're not particularly paying attention to them. A lot of times your mind kind of fills in the blanks. Using the information that the girls gave, a sketch artist came up with an image of what the man looked like. Neither of Amy's parents recognized who this man was. All of the local news stations focused heavily on the story of Amy. This man's image was put out for all to see. During one of these reports, a grief-stricken Margaret begged Amy to do anything she could to get away and to call the police. Amy, if you can hear me, you do anything you can to contact an officer of the law or call us at home. The FBI knew that the phone calls that were made to Amy's home held the key into finding out who this man was. Sadly, the technology in 1989 wasn't as sophisticated as it is today, so they were unable to trace the calls. In 1989, the phone company only kept track of long-distance numbers, and these calls were made locally. The FBI persevered, though, drafting a letter that would be sent to all of the parents who had children who attended school, both in Bay Village and neighboring cities. The letter was an inquiry to help determine if any other children had been contacted by this man. From this, they did get a promising lead. The summer before Amy was kidnapped, a girl from a neighboring city recalled the following. One day while babysitting her younger brother, a phone call came into the house in which he answered. She was in the next room, not paying much attention, but after a little while, her curiosity got the best of her, so she walked into the room and asked who he was talking to. He shrugged his shoulders in response, so she asked for the phone. There on the line was a man, whom she didn't know, asking her if she wanted to help pick out a present for her mother. He claimed he was an old friend who had not seen her mom in a long time. She became concerned at this man's request and hung up on him. She told her mother and a police report was filed. Now, just a few short months later, the girl learned that Amy was missing after receiving a similar call. While being interviewed, one of the agents noticed that the girl had several awards from different horse riding competitions. They already knew that Amy had been taking horse riding lessons, which was pretty normal for a young girl, but once he found out that they both attended the same stables, he thought this to be much more than just a coincidence. Both Amy and this girl attended Holly Hill Farms, which was 
was a stable on the edge of Bay Village. It offered stabling for horses as well as riding lessons. There was a man who worked there as a caretaker that several people described as weird. Some people thought that he paid an unhealthy amount of attention on some of the young girls. There were a few complaints from some of the mothers stating he behaved inappropriately around their daughters. A full-scale search was made on the grounds of Holly Hill Farms and the large fields that surrounded it. A pair of green sweatpants were found that resembled the pair that Amy wore on the day that she went missing. A forensic analysis was done on these sweatpants, but nothing conclusive could link them to her. Unfortunately, they did not find any evidence that would help them locate where Amy was in that search. There was a handyman who did odd jobs in Amy's neighborhood that piqued the interest of the FBI, but it was determined that he had a credible alibi for the time that Amy went missing. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, Amy's disappearance was still being talked about heavily in the news. Missing flyers for her were plastered everywhere. Several local crime shows featured Amy's story, and even America's Most Wanted did a segment on her. A number of searches were done for her over many months, all to no avail. Halloween, Thanksgiving, her birthday, Christmas, and New Year's passed, all with no word from Amy. That must have been a terrible time for her family. Then, 104 days since Amy had been kidnapped, the search for her came to a sad and heartbreaking end. On a cold and dreary February morning, Amy's remains were found on a quiet farm road in Ashland County, which is about 50 miles south of Bay Village. A jogger who had been running noticed a figure with a pale green sweatsuit laying face down in the weeds. She had been dumped about 20 feet from the rural farm road. The police searched up and down this road looking for any evidence that her killer may have left behind. Among the items collected was a long, ugly, dirty green curtain, as well as a blanket of a similar color. Amy's autopsy report revealed she had died from blunt force trauma to the head. She was also stabbed several times in her neck, one of which severed her carotid artery. It was unclear if Amy had been sexually assaulted as some of the evidence had decomposed with Amy as she lay out in that field, but logic would tell you that this is most likely the motive of her killer. Amy was found wearing the same clothes that she wore on the day that she went missing, so she was most likely killed very soon after she was abducted. Many years after that dirty green curtain and blanket were found and the involvement of forensics testing, they were able to identify some of the hairs found on these items as dog hair. Amy had a dog at the time that she went missing named Jake. They were able to compare some of Jake's hair to the hairs on these items. While the hairs were very similar, they couldn't conclusively state that they were a match. The police believe that the curtain and blanket were used to transport Amy's body. This curtain was unique in a sense that it may have possibly been homemade. The news shared the images of these items many times, hoping that someone would recognize them, but no one has ever come forward. Though police have had several persons of interest over the years, they have never released any names publicly. There are some people in the community that believe they know who did it, but there has never been any concrete evidence to connect them to Amy. It's been 32 years since the murder of this young girl, and her killer is still out there living amongst us, free to do as he pleases. He is a wolf among sheep, blending into the normal fabric of our society. If her killer was still alive now, he would be elderly. If the age range that they provided was correct, he would be in his 60s or 70s by now. When Amy's body was discovered, the FBI searched for items on and around her body that she had with her the day that she went missing. These items were small turquoise horse earrings, black ankle boots, and a black leather binder with a gold-colored clasp. These items were never recovered. They believe that her killer may have kept them as a souvenir. Amy was buried in the Highland Memorial Park located in Wisconsin. She is in the Mahalovic family plot. A small memorial was created on the grounds of Bay Village City Hall. Amy's parents would often visit. Less than two years after Amy's death, her parents divorced. All the stress and anguish as well as other factors took their toll on their marriage. Both of them dealing with their own grief they grew apart. Amy was described as the can-do kid. She was a tomboy but also a mama's girl who loved the show Golden Girls. One of her favorite movies was Dirty Dancing in which it was said that she had a crush on Patrick Swayze. She loved horse riding and spending time with her friends. They would often ride their bikes to get ice cream at the Baskin Robbins. Her father quoted Amy as saying, one day I will become president. Sadly, Amy's dreams and wishes were snuffed out the day that she went missing. A selfish, conniving, apathetic, evil killer took all that away, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. Twelve years after Amy's murder, her mother 
died from complications of lupus as well as alcohol poisoning. An article that I found read, McNulty, who was Amy's mother, she had taken her maiden name back, moved from the Cleveland area to Las Vegas the year prior. She did this to escape the media spotlight, according to her own mother. Too many painful reminders. She had been living with her mother since she moved, but was asked to leave about a month prior to her death. Her mother stated that she asked her to move out because her health was being affected by her heavy smoking. She described Margaret as a very caring and loving person who couldn't get her life back together after the death of her daughter. Margaret could not get a hold of a happy life any longer. Everything just turned her off since the death of her daughter. She died a broken-hearted woman. She was found dead in her Las Vegas apartment alone. Her phone records revealed that she hadn't returned her mother's many calls for weeks. She was only 54 years old. 32 years later, her father and her brother are still alive and still living in the Bay Village area. No doubt that this has taken a toll on both of them as well. There currently is a $50,000 reward as an incentive to catch Amy's killer. Somebody somewhere out there knows something. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch the video. I really appreciate it. I'm going to do a lot of videos just like this. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss them. Please go ahead and make a comment on the video. Any comments are welcome. I appreciate all the support. It means a lot. I'm going to end the video by posting pictures of Amy and her family in happier times. Thank you once again.